welcome. The Pathology Innovation Collaborative Community is a regulatory science initiative that aims to facilitate innovations in pathology, as well as advanced safety and effectiveness evaluation. The PI Collaborative Community aims to harmonize approaches to speed delivery to patients through collaboration in the pre-competitive space. The PI CC is open to all stakeholders, public or private, including, but not limited to, academia, industry, healthcare providers, patient and advocacy groups. Meetings of this kind are an example of lawful activity under federal antitrust law, because the focus of the meeting is on government action or policy, including the industry's responses or positions taken with respect to their team. However, antitrust monitoring is needed for companies' own protection, since they are direct competitors meeting together. These meetings need to stay within protected subject matters and need to be monitored so that they do not stray off into inappropriate areas, such as pricing and price terms, sales and service territories for particular products, customers and customer territories, each company's individual decisions regarding selection of suppliers or customers, marketing plans and especially future marketing plans for new product offerings, other proprietary or competitively sensitive information. Today's meeting will follow the written agenda and there will be no discussion of pricing or other prohibited topics. If the discussion veers into those topics, we will terminate the discussion. If you have any questions or concerns about the propriety of a discussion, please raise it immediately and we will take a break to determine how best to proceed. The Medical Device Innovation Consortium acts as the formal convener and we will follow their conflict of interest policy. For additional information, we defer to our code of conduct and our website, www.pathologyinnovationcc.org. We look forward to moving the field forward. Hello, welcome everyone. It's a pleasure to welcome you all to the SEER Cancer Microscope um, project from the Pathology Innovation Collaborative Community where we're aiming to investigate trends in the use of light microscopy um, for the diagnosis of cancer. Um, brief, quick shout out to everyone for joining um, here today. Um, there's, you know, as many of you know, many projects going on in the, in the Alliance or Pathology Innovation Collaborative Community, but we have to stay in the pre-competitive space. So this is a true pre-competitive and probably scientific project we're trying to get certain trends um, outlined. Quickly, this is the first of three meetings, mostly aiming for the design. And without further ado, I wanted to show a few slides before we jump into the discussion. And let me just see, does this work? I may jump around a bit with the slides, so this is not presenting mode, but I think hopefully this is plenty of screen space um, to enjoy this. So quickly, PICC is a community that enables all kinds of projects to be presented, identify additional collaborators, etc. So we've done that and, you know, several people couldn't make it today, but in a way there's from that PICC group, there's no competitive product development and there's no one will actively screw the project or you know contort in any way shape or form so it's basically just trying to get more people to to help with the project quickly the addressed parties are in this case collaborators supporters or stakeholders interesting in analyzing how the diagnosis of cancer has shifted with some recent technological advancements including ai and cell-free diagnostic testing we're specifically interested in real world data on how cancer is diagnosed in the US today. And I think this we should pick up later because um, if there's an option to expand that outside the US, um, we should definitely do so. But for now, and we can discuss this later, that is the, the scope. So quick background. Um, in recent years, you know, there's a lot of new methods coming up. For example, cell-free DNA testing as well as whole slide imaging especially when coupled with artificial intelligence. I selected here a paper from a German group um, from Heidelberg and Berlin. Um, and this, this paper in, um, appeared in seminars in cancer biology that examined, for example, the relationship of 
the terms AI and pathology versus AI and medicine. And you can clearly see um, some really telling trends here that, you know, despite the term AI or machine learning being quite old and as a mathematical model well established, especially in the field of pathology over the last, you know, five to 10 years, this has really spiked. Um, a similar query run today for the terms, you know, cell-free, CFDNA, etc. Um, in relation to, you know, the 16, you know, 16,000 results currently in PubMed, about 80% are in the last 10 years. So clearly cell-free testing um, has a potential. Here's another work from the Journal of Internal Medicine from two years ago, um, outlining for early detection. There's definitely, you know, not only that, but also a potential future tool. So I just wanted to use these two technologies. There are others. Radiology has phenomenal modes of detecting cancer earlier. There are other screening instruments, endoscopy, etc. So there may be other clinical modalities other than light microscopy to diagnose cancer. But I wanted to briefly use the NCI definition of cancer to say, well, how do we diagnose malignancy? And one of the key or the two key features is malignant cells can invade and destroy nearby tissue. And this sort of local invasion and seeding to distant sites is one of the key hallmarks of cancer or malignancies. And, you know, this comes, you know, from, you know, the definition that light microscopy represents the most used approach. And this could be considered in a way a gold standard, but, you know, the term gold standard is always tricky to, to truly define. So what we wanted to outline is sort of the key question, which is, can we quantify, um, how many physicians use light microscopy, how often among these technological advancements and whether the magnitude of light microscopy's use in the current diagnostic climate is relevant and or has changed. So to, to answer that, there are many, many different approaches and the one that's currently favored and that's up for discussion today is that we wanted to use the SEER database that's a stands for surveillance epidemiology and end results so that's the SEER cancer registry which captures um, cancer diagnosis from 19 u.s geographic areas covering about 35 percent of the u.s population um, that is you know obviously only one third roughly but that's the one of the largest databases um, and is considered to be representative of the demographics of the entire u.s a quick overview that um, Nisha has put together. So to, to get from um, the patient's, you know, let's say initial diagnosis to, you know, from an x-ray towards, you know, a local registry after a pathological diagnosis and then to a state registry, um, there's numerous layers until the data actually reaches the SEER database. So the SEER database is never really current as of today but it's sort of a cascade and you know it's it's cleaned after at least two different iterations so in other words a lot of people consider the SEER database a highly cleansed um, representative subset quickly um, for the background on how this idea developed during routine clinical slide scanning um, at CID a few years ago the question came up you know, how many cases are actually really diagnosed using light microscopy, which sounds like a rather simple question, but we discussed this with several people. And Nisha, um, who is a, a student at the UNC um, Chapel Hill Killing School of Co Global Public Health, said that that would be an interesting project. So we made that um, a summer internship program plan as part of the Department of Health and Policy and Management and so we're basically right after the internship to conceptualize this project. Maybe Nisha can say a few words afterwards about what that would entail. So concrete approach as we conceptualized it um, over the summer is that we want to, you know, examine the SEER database. The SEER database follows the so-called NACER terminology. I think I forgot to see here. Sorry, so this is the North American Association of Central Cancer Registries. And they do many, many things. They promote the use of cancer surveillance data, etc. 
but one element that they put out is one resource which is a unified terminology in terms of items and you know you can map to the website and, and learn a bit more about it but one of the elements in there is the so-called again one C missing Nacer item number 490 which encodes the best method of diagnostic confirmation of the cancer being reported at any time in the patient's history. So you see there is positive histology, positive cytology, or in contrast, direct visualization without microscopic confirmation, etc. So this item can be broken down into microscopically confirmed or not microscopically confirmed. Now, of course, we want to align that possibly across different cancer types. And for that, we thought to use the ICD-03. So this is the third iteration of the International Classification of Disease, the subterminology for oncology, which encodes histologic type and behavior. And that is an established um, international classification that is also used in the World Health Organization Blue Books, which is the de facto gold standard for cancer classification. So this is a ton of acronyms, right? So. <laughs> We're trying to answer a rather simple question and use the SEER database following the NACER terminology and align that with the ICDO codes that would then identify the cancer types. So the proposal is effectively that we want to use the cancer registry across tumor and cancer types rendered through or using the light microscope. Now, question is of course well why would anyone care because you know that data is available well first of all it hasn't been published in that specific context and number two with that number we would have a baseline to start and can examine time trends and it would probably provide you know payers and health tech assessment or folks who are interested in potentially knowing what the baseline is um, you know in this current diagnostic climate and aid in the preparation for either more efficient or more accessible cancer diagnostic solutions. So in a way it could form a reference set for saying, you know, these are the numbers of cancers by type that are diagnosed using um, the light microscope. So the team, many of those are on the call today, is listed here. And of course, this part here is probably the most important one. So we need a lot of input because making the, these questions, etc as streamlined and as focused as possible would be great. Um, quick, so today we're here. So this was the introduction. So we could say that that's, that they gets a check mark. Um, <laughs> and next steps would be that we want to discuss that and I invite everyone to join. And here are the next two meetings. So we would definitely run the data and, you know, do the queries, compile the data so that we would share this with the group and review it after a brief introduction at the second meeting, including a discussion of the data and review and how we would interpret this. And then probably a few weeks after, depending on Nisha's and my schedule, when we can get a first draft ready, we would review the draft all together so that all the sections, etc., make sense. So this would be basically, you know, getting the storyline straight and then we would circulate that among the authors and ask for additional input and, you know, find out whether or not we can, you know, submit this where, etc. But that would be a group decision. So for today's discussion, aside from the design and the scope, of course, the leading question here is to what degree do pathologists depend on light microscopy for cancer diagnosis? And we could probably say here, you know, physicians or patients, depending on, you know, um, I think patients or do we probably is the easiest to circumvent, you know, only one focus area. Primary endpoint would be a percentage of cancer diagnosis, but then there are many secondary endpoints. And I think with that, I would really like to, to open it up for, for discussion with the group. And I leave the slides up for now because that may make it a bit easier for the discussion if we need to jump around on this sort of as a guide. I see Kyung Min and Gina also joined. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, so what do you think? What does the group think? What's some input? 
Nisha, what did I forget? That's the most important part. <laughs> I don't think you missed anything. I think just um, we were including heme and non-heme classifications for the whole thing, right? And so I think as far as the NACER and ICDO codes, they're pretty much the same, except for I think heme has a separate subcode that includes immunophenotyping and genetic studies in it as well. But for the most part, they're pretty much the same. Very important point, correct. And then I think for in terms of the secondary endpoints, I feel like we'd also somewhat suggested maybe even geographic trends of the 19 uh, surveyed areas included in SEER if there's some sort of geographic disparities in um, light, mic light microscopy confirmation. Great point. Mm -hmm. May have missed this. What was the um, time frame that we are examining this over, and are we adding time? Um, cross-labeled with geographic tr trends. So if I'm not mistaken, the SEER database goes back over 50 years. The NACER coding is not fully consistent over the full time frame and may not be available for the same range. So I think in our sort of initial exploration, just for feasibility before presenting it to this group, we checked what 2018 right or 2015 to 2019 or so mm -hmm. it was so we checked about five six years and that is sort of an immediately available data set but there's a lot more data going back and i think ahmad you you had also um quickly done a query right and and found already some some trends etc does that answer your question, Kate? Okay. It does, thank you. So can I say something? Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, for uh, NACR, I can see available. Uh, the available is uh, 1995 uh, till uh, 2000. And this is for the uh, uh, Incidence data and the uh, uh, the pathology uh, confirmation. I mean the diagnostic confirmation. But if we want the survival, uh, then we have to. If we want to correlate this with the survival, then we want to apply with um, a specific uh, a more specific proposal, and uh, this should go to the uh, member of the. But I, I, I didn't quite understand all of it, but it sounded like for overalls or for survival data, we need a NACER member review, or is that correct? Uh, he, uh, the application has to go through a member. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the membership is available for the video or for the um, member. Oops. Uh, So, um, 
I think for this specific project, I'm not sure whether we will need survival as okay. you know an an I mean it's an it's a very interesting um idea to say is there yeah, a difference in survival if someone is diagnosed with one or another diagnostic method. So and yeah, then then we will not need uh, the survival data. Uh, the uh, the data uh, for um, an ACR is available. Uh, I mean, uh, I have prepared uh, these data, uh, like the, what I have uh, uh, sent you um, before. I, I didn't. I, I prepared it uh, in visual uh, form, but I, I have prepared the Excel sheet. So I can share it with you today. Um, so it starts from 1995 till uh, till 2018, so mm -hmm. the, like the 23 years. Uh, what I have sent you was uh, the data from this year nine, because this year nine uh, started in 1975 and continued till um, uh, 2018 and it, it includes the survival and the uh, survival and the incidents um, and this is uh, this includes all only nine cancer registries and represent 10% uh, of the US population but the uh, uh, NAACCR should represent 99% uh, of the United States uh, population. So the 10% um, fraction is still representative of 99% of the US population. Is that correct? It should be. It should be, yes. Um, and there are many publications that uh, try to validate uh, this representation. You can use them. Um, and uh, I am, I'm working on um, um, a study recently that uh, tried to compare the incidence and survival uh, between the uh, uh, SEER and uh, the National Association of Cancer Registries, and it shows uh, relatively comparable results. Yeah. This is this is very very helpful and and impressive that you know all this stuff <laughs> just by heart. <laughs> um, yeah, actually, actually, this is uh, my part of my daily um, <laughs> hobbies. <laughs> no, this is this is extremely helpful and 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 thanks for for taking the time and, and, you know, helping us with this. So I think the, you know, regarding survival, of course, this is like already like a completely different and, and new question, right? To say, for example, if we take um, a cancer type, let's say a brain tumor, right? If there's no histologic confirmation, one could assume that the patient was so sick that a biopsy or, you know, even like a, a small biopsy or stereotactic biopsy would create a clinical scenario that may be detrimental for the patient. So some of these speculations, I think, would be highly interesting. So if we would see, for example, that most patients with, um, let's call it gliomas or glioblastomas by ICDO code do not, that are not diagnosed by microscopy have a shorter overall survival, we could make some of these speculations, but it, I mean, these are probably mostly statistical associations, but you know, that would be highly interesting. And I could even, you know, envision having that data would be a great resource for others to take a look at. So thereby, you know, the question is, can you ever, let's say, render the diagnosis of a brain tumor by peripheral blood or by imaging, right? And I think those are, some of the key questions derived from this work. So what I think, or I don't know how to word this specifically, but one of the value propositions here would be as these new technologies evolve and continue to, to enter the market, that will change the fraction of microscopic versus non-microscopic diagnosis. So in a way, the survival is, of course, the, the ultimate outcome. So, 
you know, in 10 years, when many patients get diagnosed by peripheral blood, what are the subsets that still require microscopic examination? And, you know, then of course the, the other issue is regarding artificial intelligence, you know, a lot of the tools predict cancer now based on imaging or based on, you know, even microscopic examination. So it would be really, really interesting to have sort of the, the ground truth that I believe hasn't changed in a while. So maybe over the last couple of years, but I'm not sure. And I think one element that Nisha and I have discussed several times is of course, you know, the NASA item 490 accounts for some of these. For example, you know, if you look at the slide here, it says, you know, radiography and other imaging techniques, um, direct visualization, um, clinical diagnosis only, but a molecular diagnosis of cancer is currently not included. So one of the things we could bring up in the you know discussion after reviewing the data is, would there be an argument to potentially update the NASA item to account for some of these new technologies? So those were you know some of the the additional discussion points. I think there definitely would be, considering a lot of the WHO blue books are now moving in that direction, especially heme and neuro. Mm-hmm. So, um, so heme malignancies in terms of like integrating molecular findings, right? When, I mean, that, that may be a good point for the discussion, right? To say if you have a, a molecular result that indicates malignancy when morphology is not quite sufficient or and or, you know, heme and neuro, of course, yep. Yeah, we definitely see that too for like brain biopsies when we get like small biopsies and like it's hard to, it's hard to know what grade it is, but you can see like high grade features on like sequencing. Um, that'll like give you your final diagnosis. Can I add something? Oh, yeah, please. Okay, so um, this is a good idea. Um, the point that um, to check for the, for to correlate with the, uh, the pathological findings, because there is other available fields in CIR database that uh, investigate uh, the uh, markers uh, the issue is all these markers are after or available after 2000 uh, year 2000 and um, they are not co not consistent over years so some of them were added uh, starting from 2005 uh, four, and uh, uh, other uh, features or uh, other um, um, like the hormonal markers also uh, some of them started um, or started to be added in CR database for example 2008 so you will not find only what you want um, for uh, I mean on the same level and not all of the or not all the registers started adding them uh, in the same time okay so you still uh, We'll find gaps in the data. Uh, yeah, and to to make sure that uh, all the registers uh, added this, uh, or to have a start point that all regis registers started to uh, add the data, it, it will be hard job uh, for for the for the current study. But it is doable, of course. Yeah, I think the, you know, in a way, some of the, um, are you just rendering diagnosis on the side, Jared? Yeah, sorry, I had to answer a question. <laughs> That's funny. I like it. That was proof that microscopic diagnosis is still happening. <laughs> Um, I think the biomarkers 
question is, is also a good one, but um, I can consider that sort of like seed or starting points for like future consideration as well, especially pointing out that that data may not be available or um, heterogeneous across the various registries. So I think it's a it's an absolute valid point that we should try or take a look at it. But um, in terms of just knowing whether 85% or 95% of cancers are diagnosed using the lab microscope, I think that would be the the actual key punchline, sort of, you know, and then saying of the subset that's remaining, whether we can make any estimates of whether a molecular marker um, was available, even looking at one year, you know, let's say, you know, 2012 or 13 or 14, if, if you know, for one year we have a reasonable number of, of data sets that would be great. Other points. Kate, what do you think? Would this be relevant? Sort of, I, I don't know if I can tie a direct string to the, the regulatory side, but you know, it's... Well, Joe, so um, you might not recall, but my primary position is as a National Cancer Institute postdoctoral fellow in the Division of Cancer Prevention. And it's through that that I was connected with Brandon and the FDA, but um, I was hired by the NCI to pursue this type of work where evaluating the impact of new technologies and how that um, the impact of technologies has on both clinical decision making, regulatory framework, and on the patient population. So I can absolutely say that this has been a topic of discussion in the Division of Cancer Prevention and we have been looking at developing um, new clinical and research focuses with our new division director um, related to the impact of light technologies specifically. So yes, I am I am highly interested and that's why I'm here. I'm a little bit removed from my FDA work. No, totally. Um, I think I recall that there was that I heard something about NCI, but I didn't know specifically that you were working on sort of like new technologies in cancer prevention. So, I mean, the 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 one thing here is is obviously, I mean, with any new technology and you know from a regulatory perspective, the intended use, etc. If you know, I mean, Garden, you know, some of the, you know, groups that put out sort of, you know, cell-free DNA tests, I presume they have a very carefully worded intended use. I haven't looked at that. I'm not aware of any technology that claims to be replacing light microscopy yet. So, but in any case, so there's, there's definitely some, you know, hooks there for saying, you know, how will new technologies deviate this number right like so this is more in a way a baseline study right exactly and you can't measure the impact of new without having that baseline um which i think would be very important for um this type of comparison going forward and for other technologies to claim anything mm -hmm. Other points, suggestions, comments. Gina or Kyung Min. Um, Gina, any points from the Roche perspective or, you know, more the industry side? Yeah, just based off of what was just being discussed, I mean, you know, as we know, the, in, the intended use is a important aspect, um, you, you know, given what you just mentioned earlier, you know, how that's tailored, um, that drives, um, you know, the risk, how the risk is of the product, how it's classified and things like that. 
Um, so that's a, that's a key point. Um, yeah, risk assessment. Um, how to mitigate the risk, right? Having those controls in place as well is important um, to factor in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean the you know the the substratification by organ or by cancer type may actually real reveal quite a few things. I think you know. Ahmad, you mentioned that you work on retinoblastoma, right? The eye tumors, I presume many of those are diagnosed without light microscopy because, you know, they may be diagnosed completely following different paradigms. So there, it may be quite the opposite, that it stays away from light microscopy and new technologies may further improve that, let's say, you know, higher resolution cameras or other diagnostic devices. So. I think the data set may be quite interesting at the outliers, meaning those that are traditionally the not diagnosed by cancer uh, by light microscopy, and that may reveal other avenues for improved diagnostic devices as well, right? Because if you can't follow the gold standard, which would be histology, um, for other medical reasons, right? Like a brainstem biopsy is just effectively impossible. So you have to rely on other technologies and that may identify um, quite a, f a few, let's call it like intended uses or, you know, context of use that, that is not um, directly um, amenable for histologic examination. So, um, I, I wanted to add also something. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, for, for example, the treatment fields in um, uh, in SEER database, there are accuracy, um, let's say, um, I don't know, um, uh, they are not all accurate as each other. I mean, for example, the uh, radiation uh, therapy field will be the most accurate. For example, in the treatment, uh, uh, the treatment fields. Then followed, for example, by surgery, and then comes the chemotherapy as the least, uh, uh, the least accurate field. Um, the least one with the, I mean, the least uh, positive predicted value. And then uh, comes the new fields like the hormonal treatment. And um, this will be like uh, less than 60% uh, accuracy. And um, the, the pathology is one of the accurate uh, things in SEER database. So we, we can uh, highlight this in our um, in our publication or in this mm -hmm. project, um, and we can refer also to the uh, other publications that uh, uh, studied the accuracy or uh, tried to um, uh, try to compare the uh, the accuracy of this field between uh, you know there are versions of this year so there are uh, seer database that available for everybody uh, for free and there is also the seer uh, medicaid or the one connected to uh, the um, the uh, payment uh, and this database includes more fields more data about the pathology and i mean more data about the whole uh, management of the patient and uh, some of the papers uh, tried to uh, compare them and they found that the pathology is um, uh, is accurate um, in a, I mean reliable way so y y we may add this in in our publication um, referring to mm -hmm. the I mean the uh, the reliability of this field. Uh, before we go to uh, the uh, um, the, full, uh, the tracing of this field over years or over geographical lo locations. Mm -hmm. 
Well, that's a that's a very good point. So the that that is probably one of the top features, so to speak, of this. So if that data is reliable, it should be pointed out. I I fully agree. Mm -hmm. See, this is this is not available unless you're an expert in this area, because you know the the features and, for example, the reliability scores, in lack of a better term, for these. So, uh, but the papers uh, that address this uh, will be specific to specific cancers, because uh, the SIR. Um, uh, Database. I mean, the Sayer uh, Medicare database um, is connected. I mean, is is uh, accessed by uh, uh, by cancer type, and for I mean, you have to pay for each cancer type to get the data mm -hmm. uh, of this cancer type. So you will find um, only uh, the data for each cancer type. Um, because the, the researcher that uh, does this uh, type of research will not pay for <laughs> because it is very uh, expensive to do mm -hmm. this. But if, you know, even if, if some of this is exemplarily shown for some cancers, we can also reference those papers, right? And, and consider that sort of, you know, um, a I don't know, proof or at least a citable component of this. Okay, yeah, right. I mean, one other one other element is, of course, you know, when, when we go back to how the SEER database gets their data, right? So it may be worth, so we have good connections to the Massachusetts State Registry because um, there may be data parsing happening, you know, at the state registry level, but also, for example, at our local, you know, healthcare system level, local registries. Um, so what I thought was, was very interesting when we when were digging into a bit deeper, of course, the submitted data has a, has a bit of a lag, but there's a lot of work and effort that goes into the parsing of the pathology report and I, I, I copied this definition out of the, the NACER item description because it says reported at any time in the patient's history, right? So for some cancers, let's say, you know, cancers where some of the patients survive quite a long time, let's say completely removed, you know, melanoma or a prostate cancer or, you know, some of the, you know, like, I don't know, lower stage cancers, the, the local registries are actually the ones that integrate over time and the data is submitted, then the state registry integrate over time. And I think I think the newer data sets in the SEER database also have sort of time trends um, in terms of like what type and what behavior it is. So that that is a, like a, a layer of complexity that, that most people probably forget about, you know, that in some cancers we're looking at an individual cancer patient journey over 20, 25 years with even secondary malignancies and or recurrences, et cetera. And that may obviously be different for, from, you know, a, the primary modality of a diagnosis. So in a way, the if at any one point in time a patient received, you know, a microscopic diagnosis, that will be the lead sort of item as far as I understand it, I don't know if if someone can help with that, but that layer I, I haven't seen discussed anywhere. So, other other suggestions. So, of course, there are other encoding schemes regarding cancer types, right? So naming conventions or actual names, but I think ICD-03 is currently considered the gold standard or um, any other suggestions or comments here? Yeah, so um, the uh, ICD-03 is the, um, um, is the uh, common standard. I mean, the 
uh, standard for uh, the uh, low level uh, nomenclature, but, but which um, which higher level will, will we use for grouping the the tumors? Um, so we have multiple um, multiple tumors or classifications. So we have, for example, the uh, uh, AYA, the um, uh, the um, the one for um, adolescents and young adults classification. And we have the international classification of childhood cancers, and we have the um, <clears throat> the WHO uh, grouping uh, ICD-03 uh, grouping um, by site. So this is um, a question that mm -hmm. uh, we will need to uh, to answer. Yeah. So the ICDO is, is indeed finely granular and for, you know, the easy digestible format for a paper, it may be easier to just say lung cancer or, you know, head and neck cancer or, you know, um, whatever, urogenital tract, you know, to, to make it, you know, even like larger scale anatomic. So I think I've seen some tumor classifications that sort of break it down to about 30 to 40 sort of anatomic subsites and what Nisha mentioned earlier when we looked into the the classification even heme tumors are completely separate so they're classified slightly different um, mm -hmm. yeah but they are are, are already uh, too many I mean correct <laughs> uh, if yeah so uh, uh, what I have done is um, is grouping i mean I mean doing the statistics uh, for the higher level um uh, the highest levels like the leukemias lymphomas um uh, cns uh, neuroplastoma and so on and uh, by the, the point is um when the data in each category is less than 16 uh, we cannot report this. This is a limitation also, uh, or a privacy concern um, in the uh, NACCR database. Mm -hmm. So if if we have uh, a group that contains six, less than 16 patients, then we cannot report this. Um, so we have to, I mean, I, this is my opinion, we have to stick to the higher groups. Um, when we report uh, higher higher levels of grouping, um, and uh, it will be hard to um, yeah to gather two things in the same time. I mean, to sub sub uh, doing uh, correlation between, for example. Uh, the uh, the uh, geographical locations and the tumor subtypes. Mm -hmm. This this will create gaps uh, in, um, in the, when we uh, trace the trends, because some years maybe less than sixteen will include patient less than sixteen patients, and then we will not have any data out of this year because just it is less than 16 patients. Okay. Yep. So going so deep uh, will not be uh, good uh, for um, the tracing uh, issue. So that, that would be a strong argument for, let's say, higher level groupings, right? Yeah, exactly. This is what I'm asking. Uh, about uh, which higher level uh, grouping will we use? So I don't know uh, if I you can, can, I can if you mm -hmm. can see the screen. I don't know if if, if you yeah if yeah you I see. can see it. So this is from I think you know this is NIH slash NCI has these cancer registry surveillance modules and within that there's site specific modules, and while completely imprecise and every pathologist gets goosebumps when reading this because you know a lot of things are just summarized but this is sort of a I think a an officially at least citable 
site-specific module and I think for an average physician this is like a good sort of overview. It's incomplete and it's imperfect but I, I think this is sort of officially, um, it, I don't know, there are probably 20 different versions of grouping tumors by site but I think as you mentioned earlier leukemia versus lymphoma is distinguished here and then you know I mean I don't know cervix uterus ovarian cancer and breast cancer in some classifications is even summarized as you know female malignancies you know typically occurring there and then testicular and prostate etc is, is otherwise so I don't know this is just one that I that I frequently use yeah, when, when parsing data yeah, but here, for example, I think lung cancer is uh, put as a um, separate group, for example. But if we go to, um, I'm opening my computer. So if we go to the um, ICD-03, um, ICC, uh, IEEE site record, uh, ICD-03, WHO 2018, there is no higher level um, lung cancer uh, available for um, presenting the uh, these uh, type of tumors and yeah we we have then to create our own I mean if, the... if you need to do this like this uh, I mean if you need uh, site specific site specific um, uh, grouping uh, then we have to create our own um, classification variable. I mean, the you know, in lung cancer, of course, you know, the morphology subclassification comes to mind, but that's my bias because I'm a pathologist. To some, it may be more the treatment subset, which is probably non small cell versus small cell, but that has also been like slightly different. But you know, the um. I think this is, you know, for lung cancer, I believe, you know, the the average reader, I don't know, I presume for lung cancer having non-small cell versus small cell versus other would account for 95% for of, of tumors. So I think this, I mean, moving up in the hierarchy and detail is usually easier than moving down, right? Because if you want to get more detailed, that's harder than getting less detailed if you have the detailed data. So I think that was at least when when Nisha, Emma and I discussed this, why we initially said let's start with ICDO. I think the, the problem is with some tumors in the ICDO3 classification, let's say a neuroendocrine carcinoma, um, that may be its own code, but you don't know where that tumor is, right? It may be in the lung, it may be in the GI tract, it may be in the stomach, it may be somewhere else. So um, the ICD-03 code is not necessarily site specific. So I think we have to, we just have to, you know, in terms of an analytical plan, when we look at the data, I think we just have to be careful to make sure that we're not formulating a key message that is ultimately skewed by, you know, an not site specific ICD-03 code. Um, we will use it, uh, as I've mentioned, but uh, I want to show you, can I share mm -hmm. my screen for one minute? Oh, absolutely. I think I made you co-host okay. earlier. Uh, one moment. I hope my internet helps me. While, while you're putting up this, would I, could I ask folks to put in their email into the chat to Ulla, um, just so we can circulate, you know, the update and summary and the PowerPoint that I've been typing here. That we have the contact information of everyone. Thank you, thank you. Does it work, Ahmad? Uh, still loading, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. I'm um, well, while, while, while this is loading, we're almost at the top of the hour. Maybe we can 
try to get a next date in on the books. So I think we need a few weeks to pull the data and then, you know, share it with the group. So maybe if we're looking at roughly three weeks, maybe the 24th of September or the 1st of October. What do you guys think? Twenty fourth. Can we do the same? Okay. Any objections? <laughs> then let's do the twenty fourth, same time, or should we try a bit earlier? Maybe one o'clock. Then it's not that late in Europe. <laughs> Ulla could I Ulla could I ask you to update that so that we have so nine nine twenty four one p.m. as the next time. Mm hmm. You cloned yourself. That is a great idea, Ahmad. Oh, uh, what can I do? Uh, uh, Recording in progress. 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 <laughs> So, um, so uh, can you see uh, my can you screen see now? I muted. I, I muted one of the Ahmads so that we don't have an echo. Now both are muted. <laughs> Is it okay? Yes. Okay, so here is the ICD-03. Uh, this is the program that I use for uh, data extraction uh, from the uh, SEER database. It's called SEERSTAT. And this is the field um, that is called ICD-03. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can see here uh, the, uh, the level of the coding um, of the tumors. So ICD-03 uh, alone without um, grouping will be uh, too hard to analyze because there are many too uh, many uh, too many uh, subgroups within or not subgroups they are all the same level so all of these are on the same level and it will be very hard to uh, analyze to group this they made um, the site record here for ICD-03 mm -hmm. and even this, uh, this uh, subgrouping is also too much, I see. Okay, so even we have to summarize this uh, grouping to a higher level uh, but this looks as if it's indented, right? So, for yeah, example, yeah, exactly. So we can choose which level of this perfect. we should use. Okay. So, what is the total number in the site recode parent tree? Uh, I have already prepared this. It is here. <laughs> so. It's it's 10 p.m. and you're one step ahead. I I'm so happy. Thank you for joining again. <laughs> you are welcome. Uh, just yeah, here. So this is by state. And for oops. United States, um, uh, this is by year, total is to 22,251. Uh, and the whole population is seven billion um, for years. Sorry, that so. I, I, I was imprecise. What I meant is in the site recode. Uh, site recode, but uh, the, uh, 
this will show everything so no but i, I mean, think i think uh, you're... this is the same number it will be the same number no I'm, i meant something much more simple can you go back uh, okay. to the side recode here yeah yes you know there's okay. sort of like the the various sub sub categories for example where it said yeah. long so all sites that means all the patients so this is no uh, this is why I, I give you mm. i meant for example the oral cavity and pharynx has a subset of of sub classifications but if you only count the parent tree so meaning in this case colon rectum as one yeah this is yeah this is what i do generally so i create a new variable and this is digestive system it will take one minute so this is amazing video boring point is we have to be consent consistent on which level mm -hmm. uh, we uh, choose to work so this is the whole thing I have to and how many rows are there in the groupings field now we will know so I have created a new variable here and we just need to know by diagnostic confirmation or so this would be the whole I think when I ask how many you think about how many patients but what I meant is just how many rows in that new variable that you just created 120 that's still 120 no yeah, it looked like less than that. I I agree. Uh, so maybe the uh, the uh, the spilleted this. So I will know now. Well, I think it's it's fair to say that this will be probably an a practically relevant tree. So we don't have to go like multiple layers deep. I think the the side recode parent tree seems to be complicated enough for. You know, and if someone wants to dig deeper, of course, that's possible, but. This is amazing. So the query. Uh, it may take uh, one minute to receive the answer from, uh, from the SEER database. Because it is long uh, query and um, it, it includes too many patients. So they have to, to uh, process the data of uh, these 20,000 patients. I think there will be a large enough data set to make a reasonable assumption of how many are diagnosed using the light microscope. <laughs> okay. Are there other final comments, suggestions for the next meeting? So I think the you know, combination of, of, of skills here, I think will make it a, a really good sort of data pool. And then we see how we can visualize it and share this with the group for, you know, preparation before the next meeting. And then, you know, once we, once we have that, then I believe we can look at certain subset of cancers and really look at maybe some edge cases or common cases, you know, like, for example, the top common 10 cancer types, right? Prostate, breast, lung, colorectal, um, to see whether those show any specific trend in one or another direction. And then look at, you know, like Ahmad had, had emailed me before, like retinoplastoma or some of the, the other cancers that are typically not biopsied and, and seeing whether that is different. All right. There are no other questions or comments. I thank you very much. And we will update this relatively quickly and get this online. And thanks again for taking the time and, and contributing here. This is fantastic.
Thank you. I will. Thank you. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Bye. 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 Bye.